Your father was a poet. Uh, we, we didn't finish, I don't think, with psychedelics, though. I had one footnote. I tried something called ecstasy a few years ago and had a very useful, interesting experience of remembering an old literary enemy whom I argued with in my mind like the blue meanie for years and suddenly saying, oh, that good old blue meanie. He's been around since I was in college. He's been annoying me and I've thrown all my thunderbolts at him. He's been working for me all these years and suffering. How can I hate him? <laughs> it was just this transformation from, from aggressive resentment to, to gratitude at having somebody I could, who could define my limits, so to speak, or, or define what, it, what my this objections. This was Norman Portales. Yes, yes. It was very funny, actually. I wrote him about it, but he said, you still don't understand me. <laughs> Uh, so, and so, uh, the, the last thing I would say oh, about sorry. that is a conversation with the poet Henri Michaud, who said he was not so much interested in what experiences people had on psychedelics, but what they did the next day, how they were to apply, how, they, how people were able to apply them in concrete terms, in real, uh, real, uh, alternative, ordinary mind. Okay, onward and upward. Onwards and upwards, and I'm trying to ask you about your father being yes. a poet. Was he a good one? Well, he was quite a great uh, lyric poet, as lyric was understood in those days. Not, you know, lyric comes from uh, the lyre, a stringed instrument, like Bob Dylan is the perfect lyric poet and maybe the greatest poet and of this half of the century, and certainly better known than me, incidentally. I'm not the most well-known American poet. I would say Bob Dylan is, and he's a respectable poet, too. But uh, my father wrote what was called lyric, that is, without music, without strings, the forms of lyric poetry, rhymed uh, verse. And so I learned that at his, as an apprentice at his uh, knee at, when I was five years old and can even do uh, spontaneous rhyme and can do it any time and can continue as long as I want and stop when I faint. <laughs> so there's a, a, a family uh, business here involved. He wrote a, a number of very beautiful poems which I've echoed particularly in a poem called Father Death Blues, which was a threnody on his death in 1975, uh, which is one of my favorite poems and uh, maybe the deepest poem I've written uh, since Kaddish. Except maybe White Shroud is like a, another long poem, a dream vision poem, in which I meet my mother again in 1983 as a bag lady in New York <laughs> and have a chance to take care of her as I hadn't when she was uh, alive. Did your Jewishness matter too much when you were young? Well, my father was socialist, my mother left-wing communist, and they were both uh, agnostics, as they called themselves. And my own Buddhist uh, conclusion is non-theistic. And there is some problem with the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition of an absolute hierarchical old nobo daddy outside, as Blake calls him. So uh, the... Uh, Jewish aspect, uh, I think, passed by, though I was interested in Martin Buber and visited him, and uh, who was a great Jewish philosopher and a Hasidic expert, and uh, uh, Gershom Sholem, whom I admired a great deal, and I read a lot of his work, and worked with him trying to determine the names of the eons from Sophia on down to the Garden of Eden. I visited him in Jerusalem in 1961, I think and saw him again in Paris and we worked out for a poem called Plutonian Ode, worked out all the, the names of the eons and the archons of the eons. Are you a writer or a performer? Are, are you best read on the page or heard in performance? Well, what would you say about Homer? Was he a writer or a performer? He was certainly oral. It wasn't written down till later. What would we say about Sappho, who both wrote and performed? What would we say about Campion? who wrote and performed, or Dolan, or Waller, or, or Waller whose music was set, or whose poems were set to music. I'm primarily a writer, actually. Uh, I conceive poems in my inner ear. But there is a dimension of sound, and there is the preparation in America of a vehicle for idiomatic communication, vernacular communication, using vernacular rhythms and diction. And that's been my specialty so that it's possible to perform or recite or orate or vocalize, I would say, my poems and have them understood more rapidly and uh, almost instantaneously as ordinary speech or intense fragments of ordinary speech best. 
you write, you treat, you uh, provoke, you mock public themes. You write about America. Has that writing over these years, now collected mm -hmm. in a great volume of collected work with new work still mm -hmm. coming out, has that writing had a political effect? I think it had some. Uh, you know, I saw Bob Dylan um, a couple of weeks ago, this being, what, December 94, and he was saying, who owns all the money? Who owns the media? As he travels around the world, he notices that the, all the media change their story every week, that somebody is directing that. And who owns all the money, he was saying. And it was like he knew he had a great deal of power to influence pe people's psyches or minds or thinking or psychology or opinionation. And yet his own power was minuscule compared to the power of the moguls of the media. And in America, it's only 22 people who, run a, who own 80% of the mass media, so that the it would be very difficult for a poem or a poet to overcome that barrage of bullshit. <laughs> On the other hand, poetry is the only place where you get an individual person telling his subjective truth, what he really thinks as, as distinct from what he wants people to think he thinks, like a politician or a, uh, someone preparing an editorial in a dignified newspaper. So if you need the historical truth of what people think inside, you have to follow Shelley and his admonition that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the race. Or what William Carlos Williams said more, in, more acutely was, uh, the government is of words. After all, all the, the, the people making political speeches, they're writing prose, if not poetry, and they're trying to get a little flowery language in there. But the language is shifty and the language is manipulative. And people who are advertising or even doing ordinary mass media are still inhibited and can't say what they really think. But the poet can say what he really thinks authentically. And that's the advantage. And it's longer lasting than the immediate radio broadcast or television broadcast. Because poem is like a radio that can broadcast continuously for thousands of years. So in the long run, it may have an ameliorating effect on the spirit. Would the life that you lived in the 50s and 60s and 70s... Same life I'm leading now, not much different. Has AIDS affected that life? Yes, I have to use a condom now. <laughs> not that I can get it up to penetrate anybody, because I'm getting 68 and have diabetes, so I'm relatively impotent. So I don't personally need one, but if anybody wants to <laughs> amuse me, they'd better use a condom. <laughs> Who was the love of your life? Well, a number of people, actually. Uh, many crushes, and I have, have one a day, you know, doesn't everybody? <laughs> but uh, Peter Orlovsky, I've lived with, you know, and been related to since 1954. So that's, what is that now, uh, 40 years. And uh, I saw him the day before I left from America to France, actually, a few weeks ago. Uh, I had an old boyfriend uh, or love that I never slept with and, uh, as a student, and I still cherish his memory, and we're old friends now. I was in love with Kerouac. I think uh, sexually the most interesting and emotionally turbulent and painful, pleasurable was Neil Cassidy, with whom I had sort of a funny affair that lasted 20 years, I mean, on and off in bed, naked. So I've had a very fortunate life, actually, in that sense of any fantasy, naive fantasy I had as an adolescent was somewhat satisfied. As you get older, what do you most fear? Oh, I think um, cancer of the rectum, maybe. <laughs> that is the pain of... Well, I have a one-line poem. Get used to your body. Forget you were born. Suddenly you've got to get out. <laughs> so the uh, exit from the body, uh, whatever pain that is in the, there is in that, might be fearful, just the physical pain, as I'm a coward, basically. Maybe everybody is, but I'm certainly a coward there. I have very good uh, Tibetan Buddhist teachers who have given me doctrines on how to leave the body or how to approach death. Uh, very interesting conversations with them, and there's a certain uh, stability in that view. Uh, but. Uh, you know, I'm just a flesh and bones with the high blood pressure and the weak heart and some problems with my kidneys. Both Bob Dylan and Jack 
Kerouac uh, described you, I think, as a con man, extraordinaire. What did they mean? Oh, maybe they were projecting their, their own goofiness on me. Uh, uh, with Dylan, it's a reference to the trickster hero. You know, the, uh, um, I, I remember the last time I saw Dylan was, uh, he asked me about Blake, ne next to the last time I saw him. He said, do you know the poem that begins, I asked a thief to steal me a peach? And I continued, holy and meek, he cries. I asked a lithe lady to lie her down. She turned up her eyes. As soon as I went, along came a thief and twixt earnest and joke, stole a peach from the tree, and without one word spoke, still as a maid, enjoyed the lady. So it's a question of twixt earnest and joke, I think, which characteristic of Dylan, and somewhat characteristic of uh, 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 Kerouac, certainly. How would you like us to remember you? Oh, I think uh, Father Death Blues, the poem Father Death Blues. Maybe I should sing that. Could that be of interest? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I've mentioned it before. I think it's the fruition of my Buddhist training. When my father died, Chugyam Trungpa Rinpoche, my teacher, I said, I extend my thought that your father entered Dharmakaya, empty blue sky. Please let him go and continue your celebration. Hey, Father Death, I'm flying home. Hey, poor man, you're all alone. Hey, old daddy, I know where I'm going. Father Death, don't cry anymore. Mama's there underneath the floor. Brother Death, please mind the store. Old Auntie Death, I hear your groans. Old Uncle Death, I see your bones. Oh, Sister Death, how sweet your moans. Oh, children deaths, go breathe your breaths. Sobbing breaths so ease your deaths. Pain is gone, tears take the rest. Genius death, your art is done. Lover death, your body's gone. Father death, I'm coming home. Guru death, your words are true. Teacher death, I do thank you for inspiring me to sing this blues. Buddha death, I wake with you. Dharma death, your mind is new. Sangha death will work it through. Suffering is what was born. Ignorance made me forlorn. Tearful truths I cannot scorn. Father breath, once more farewell. Birth you gave was no thing ill. My heart is still as time will tell.